guys, welcome back. This is our final day of the RAND Online Coaches Clinic. Uh, we're joined this afternoon with JP Nervin. JP Nervin is a sports consultant and mentor with Thrive One Challenge and author of the book Calling Up. Uh, JP, delighted to have you. Um, it's all yours. You can go ahead, sir. Well, appreciate the opportunity. Um, it's it's good to be back uh, in Ireland. I just moved back here in November. I got started in coaching in Limerick. I used to coach for the Limerick Lakers, did a little bit of time with Limerick Lions, college team and all that over there. So um, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's good to be able to connect with some coaches in Ireland here. So I appreciate the opportunity. Um, please let me know if my PowerPoint is not showing because um, it should be up in there and ready to go here. So that's, that's what I'm trying to set up there. So. All right, um, so uh, we chose the topic of kind of building character in sports and raising standards. And uh, I take a systematic approach to doing that, which I'll explain here today. And we call it the support and accountability system. And, uh, and uh, just a little bit of background on my approach to, to this. I think it could really kind of start from just a bit of my experience actually and what I do currently. So I, I used to play basketball at the University of South Carolina. Uh, then I moved over to Limerick, Ireland, where I got st started uh, in coaching. I coached over there five years before I moved back to the States and I was coaching there in, in high school level in Tennessee. Um, then in 2017, I started Thrive On Challenge, which is the consulting business I do. I work with high schools and college teams all the way from division one to a freshman high school coach. And I work with them on developing a culture, a culture of high standards and really strong relationships, one that actually builds character. Um, also have the podcast, the Coaching Culture Podcast. Some of you may have heard of it. Uh, you know, good, good, strong listener base out of Dublin as well. Um, yeah, so I work as a mentor and, cult and culture consultant. And we just moved back to Ireland in November uh, from Pen central Pennsylvania. And my wife works now for Google. So we're, we're, like I said, we're really glad to be back here. And this is cool to do a webinar for people in the Irish basketball community here. Um, when it comes to that culture that we're trying to build, and that really when it's transformational culture that develops character, develops, that develops the character of the people we're working with, um, there's two things that are absolutely critical in that. Strong relationships and high standards. And there's a limit to where you can go in raising your, the standards in your program if you don't have relationships with individuals. And there's, um, and, and vice versa. Um, you can't really strengthen relationships if you don't hold people to high standards, if you don't challenge them to be better versions of themselves. And um, I just wanna mention here what I've tried in the past. And, and, and when it comes to uh, the way that I've tried to build a character, because when I got into coaching, um, you know, 12, 13 years ago, I, I, I just wanted to give back. You know, I, I'd gotten so much from the game of basketball. And here I wanted to use uh, sports, you know, to give back, to help, help others, you know, to impact others more positively. And um, so in, in trying to do that and trying to approach coaching and, and build character within my program to maintain high standards, I was big into motivational speeches early on, especially being American. That's obviously your kind of default thing is uh, you grew up on the movies, you grew up in that type of atmosphere and uh, motivational speeches can often be your default. Uh, long lectures, you know, halftime lectures, post-game lectures, we got to try harder here. That's not acceptable. Um, I would often yell. I was a, a big yeller, big screamer for probably the first eight years of my coaching. Um, justified it for with a lot of reasons I'll talk about in a second. And uh, punishment, you know, get on the line, run, you know, just being that stereotypical tough coach was often my default kind of response as well too. And so I'd try to be really, really tough on my guys. And uh, sometimes later on, especially when I was over in coaching in Tennessee at the high school level there, I tried to say, let's bring them in the classroom, let's talk about character. And it's not that any of those things that I um, have right up there aren't effective, right? They can be effective sometimes in getting short-term compliance or obedience and the things that we're asking them to do. But that's not really developing character. Um, it might be even teaching about character, it might be talking about character, but character comes from reps. Reps when we are challenged, reps at doing the right thing um, consistently, especially when it's not easy. And that's what, you know, so using sports to build character 
it's really not done in a speech or in the classroom. It's done through the sport itself. It's done in the practice session, uh, in the game. And, and and yes, there's other times and team meetings or other team events that we can learn and practice character as well. And that's what I'm going to get into today, which is the support and accountability system, which is a systematic approach to really training those behaviors. I just want to mention this because this slide really resonates with a lot of people. And if you know anything about my history as a coach, or if you ever got to or saw me coach in Ireland, I don't know who's really on this call here, but um, you, you would know that I was a passionate, fiery individual who loved being the loudest guy in the gym every time I, I coached a basketball game. And um, I, I learned through the course of my uh, coaching career many reasons why we should not actually yell at our players. I say at, there's a difference between yelling at and yelling to. Yelling to people, calling out instructions is sometimes appropriate and effective. But uh, I really believe we shouldn't be yelling at players, and, and for these reasons in particular. The first is that tough coaching is intentional. I, I always viewed myself as a tough coach. I was hard on guys. I was really, really loud. Um, but that's not really tough. It's not tough to just have an emotional reaction when things don't go my way or a player doesn't do what I want or I don't get a call by a referee. Um, it's tough to manage your emotional state, to be in control. That's tough. And I, and I think that we have a misconception. Oh, he's a tough coach because he's up there storming the sidelines and he's, he's yelling and all that stuff. Um, we want emotionally regulated athletes. I think that's really, really important um, because we want players that can control their emotions. And so to do that, we need to be um, in control of our emotions. This kind of ties in with the next one, which is we want athletes who can think. And so if we understand a little bit about the brain science, which I'm gonna go into a little bit later today, but we understand anything about brain science, we know that the, the brain, um, I'm gonna really make this really simple, uh, is let's just say there's the lower part of the brain, the upper part of the brain. It's a little bit more complex than this, but there's a lower part, which has our limbic system, the amygdala is located. It is our fear center. It is the flight, fr uh, flight or, um, sorry, fight or flight response or the, uh, the, the freeze uh, response that we often get. And um, that is the earlier part of our brain that is developed. Now, the upper part of the brain is the higher cognitive part of our brain, okay? And to be able to communicate between the lower and upper parts of the brain is that, you know, that, that uh, stress response system is what they call it, and the higher cognitive parts of our brain, we need to be in control of our emotions and we not need, need to not sense any threats there. So if I'm yelling at an athlete or an athlete's already enduring some amount of stress within the game, which naturally occurs, sports are stressful, which is why they can be so uh, beneficial. But if they're enduring some sort of stress and I'm sitting there yelling or screaming, even if it's not directly at them, but if I'm only heightening that stress response, there is literally a disconnect between the lower part of the brain and the upper part of the brain. And so because of that, we want them to be emotionally regulated so they can think. And to do that, we need to be in control of our stress response. We want to create an intrinsically motivated environment. I mean, bottom line here is, do you want your players to play hard? Do you want them to have a good attitude? Do you want them to do all the right things because it's the right thing to do? It's because it's the player they want to be. It's the team they want to be. It's the outcomes they want to achieve. Or do you want them to do those things because you told them to, and they're afraid of the consequences, or they're doing it for your approval. So to intrinsic, intrinsic creating an intrinsically motivated environment requires us uh, to be a little bit more intentional and nuanced and, uh, and really avoid our default ways of coaching, which are often yelling, uh, which is a very extrinsic way of motivating individuals. We wanna lead with love or respect, uh, whatever word you prefer there, and instead of fear, okay? Uh, we want to develop player leadership. If we're always intervening with yelling and screaming, uh, we're not allowing them to step up and be leaders. Yelling is unacceptable in pretty much any other profession. We don't really tolerate teachers yelling at students. We don't uh, allow uh, CEOs or heads of companies or managers to really yell at any individuals anymore. It's just not tolerated or accepted in the business world today or in education. But for some reason, we have accepted it still in sports, and, and we are behind the ball on this. Um, we need to set a positive example. How often we, we really encourage our own players to yell at each other? How often is that the healthier, best way to resolve 
challenges and are in conflict. We want to prepare them for the world. And uh, it kind of comes back to the intrinsic motivation, but also in developing that leadership um, and um, just the type of person and leader they want to be. Um, simply, there is a better way. And that's what this all is about today. And that's what I'm going to jump in to right here is the support and accountability system. This is a better way. It's more beneficial. It's going to lead to better results and better relationships uh, and better people. And that's what, that's what we're working on here. So let's talk about that better way. The support and accountability system has three different stakeholders. There's first off the individual. I take responsible responsibility for myself. I hold myself accountable. There is the team. My the team is my support network. They help to support me and when necessary, hold me accountable and responsible uh, to certain standards. And then there is the coach. The coach is there to help, uh, once again, support me when I don't hold myself accountable, my teammates don't hold myself accountable, um, and the coach steps in to support me and when necessary, hold uh, hold me accountable. Um, there's kind of three phases, and I'm gonna uh, show you a little bit about each phase here. There's the first phase, which is to establish standards. Second phase is to support standards. And lastly, that is to enforce standards. So let's talk about that first stage of establishing standards what that means. We do this in a lot of different ways. We have coaching non-negotiables. We do a, what's called a team manifesto, where they sit down and it is essentially the players set the, some standards for the program. The coach non-negotiables are two to three standards that we encourage coaches to set themselves, whereas we really encourage them to empower the players to set the remaining, remaining standards of how we want to run this program. Who do we want to be as a team? And then there is the before action review, which is before practices, before games, before even a drill, you say, hey, what are our standards? What are our success criteria in this drill? And lastly, there's the standards review, which I'm going to go and do a little bit of a deep dive here with you right now on how you do what's called a standards review. So I want to take and, and, and just show you how we do it. It would do a standards review. This could be done on the court. It could be done in the in the locker room before the game. It could be done in a team meeting. Um, I've done this before. My team ate dinner at a restaurant. We were traveling down to Florida, and I said, "All right, before we go in that restaurant here, let's identify what's acceptable look like, what's unacceptable look like as we eat out here, you know, to represent our program." So when it comes to that, our, our bench. Let's just talk about you know one of the things that I think most coaches and most teams struggle with, and that is to have an engaged bench that everyone is you know, locked in, cheering for each other. So for example, my team could have really bench or poor bench decorum. You guys are not focused, not paying attention. They're checked out. They're not cheering for each other, not standing up when good plays happen. So I might pull them in before a game or I might pull them in after, after um, you know, before a practice and say, all right, let's talk about our bench guys, okay? Um, I just used the warrior way here. Say, let's say my team was the Warriors. You could be the Celtics. You could be the the Stars, or you could be whatever it is. Uh, but we, you know, you might have the warrior way as your kind of your your like what you're striving for. Uh, you could have some uh, core values. Many programs pick like, hey, uh, love and effort is what we're about here, or we're about trust, care, commitment, uh, whatever it be. Um, take your kind of values or your guiding principles of the program and say, what does that not look like? And sound like so start with unacceptable right start with these unacceptable behaviors so um it, on the bench what will be unacceptable behaviors that we we could be demonstrating and that could say well not staying up and cheering that could be you know not paying attention and, and uh, not staying up when a player comes off off the floor so the, all those different things you want them to identify unacceptable behaviors and here's the thing even those guys or girls that are demonstrating those be unacceptable behaviors on a regular basis, they're probably going to speak up and even and point those out. Um, you know, so it's a really valuable conversation. And then you want to go to what is acceptable. So what does it look like? What does it sound like? What is our our way, the warrior way or the Celtic way? What does that look like on the bench? What are acceptable behaviors? So they might identify three things, five things around, hey, we stand up when players come off the court, we stand up when people take charges. Uh, we are encouraging our teammates 
we're shouting out reminders, uh, we're echoing the calls uh, of for the offense, whatever it be. But you try to identify three or five things around the way that they should be during that bench. And then the other thing is, how can we support these behaviors? That's the next question: is how can we support these behaviors? Um, really, really important because uh, people aren't always going to fall through on those things. Right? They're not going to always be perfect, and you can say that's okay. But if I see a teammate not at acceptable, then what should we do? What should I do? Well, I can encourage them to lock in, to focus. Hey, man, come on, encourage your teammates. So you have that conversation. They say, okay, well, how can the coaches support you? If you're struggling to stay locked in on the edge of the, on the bench there, how can the coaches step in and, and help to support you to get back to that acceptable state there? So that's kind of a little bit of the standards review. You can do that with any aspect of your program. Um, you might also talk about what are the consequences for failing to self-correct. And, and let's just say in the bench, for instance, you know, a consequence would be you just don't go in the game. You know, we talk about this a lot with coaches. You sub a player off, <clears throat> they're upset they got subbed off. So what do they, I mean, we've all done, had this happen. They're, they're annoyed. They're not coachable. They're not listening. They just go over and slouch on the bench. They don't high five their teammates. Well, we talk about, all right, that's okay. You've had a moment. You're emotional. There was bad calls. You picked up your third foul um, or you're just frustrated. We get it. But you're not going back into the game until you move to acceptable. Like there's no point of me putting you back in the game until you are demonstrating those behaviors like you're locked in, you're cheering for your teammates, um, you're, you're shouting out encouragement and reminders. Like you're not going back in the game until you do, you're, you're at that state. And this is a really, really simple way to make sure that they're ready. But I've often in the past would say, hey, I'm not going putting you back in the game until you look like you're ready. Well, what does that look like? Well, here you have to find that. So the consequences are typically, you just don't go back in the game in this instance. But they, obviously the consequences could vary. Um, and I'm gonna share you a few more examples in a second. We'll move on here to the next thing, which is our um, so how we support standards. A live self-assessment um, where in a practice session, a game, uh, we ask players to rate or uh, let us know where they feel their effort is, their attitude is. And, and we really want players that can self-assess and self-correct. We use, with a lot of our programs, what's called the Captain's Council. It's a, you know where we have a one to three or a one to four ratio of captains to players on the team, and they lead a unit. And uh, it's a great way to support various standards that you've outlined in the program. Peer interventions. Uh, this is big within games and, and within practices, but outside of that as well. When people are struggling to be at an acceptable uh, uh, standard, to meet those standards, having your peers, having your teammates step in and intervene is valuable as well. Uh, if we do formal assessments occasionally every couple of weeks, every month in the programs that we work with, they're setting up Google Forms or something like that to have players just to self-reflect on themselves or to reflect on each other. Uh, it's just mentioned here, we use uh, we bring personality into this, so equilibria in sports. Uh, you just can um, Google that, equilibria in sports, if you're interested in more about that. It's similar to DISC or straight finders, but it's really understanding every player's personality. It's a really powerful program that we use, um, and it, it helps us to understand the personality of each individual because personality impacts how I can best support that, that, that player. So, um, you know, and it's a little bit more complex and there's some complexities to that, but we really try to encourage understanding each individual, their personality, so we can best know how to connect with them. Connecting correct. I'm gonna do a deep dive into that in a second here, uh, what that all means. And one-on-ones, just sitting down, having those conversations with, with, with the players before, after sessions, uh, outside of games, and just connecting. We're really intentional on that. So let's let's just take one area. And I know it seems really complex, but you know this is coaching. I mean, this is it's, it's really not super super complex. But these are all the systems and strategies that we bring to be an effective coach to to teach them and to help them make those corrections. So we talk about connect before you correct. And there's a great book out there called The Whole Brain Child by Daniel J. Siegel. It goes into the psychology of the brain. And there's a couple of things that 
are worth mentioning here. And the first is, I mentioned the upper and the lower part of the brain earlier. Uh, the left side of the brain is the logical left. It's that very uh, you know, logical, rational part of our brain. And also the right part of the brain tends to be the more creative and emotional side. And then I also mentioned the lower part and the upper part of the brain earlier, which is the lower is the reactive part and then the receptive, the thinking, the cognitive part of the brain. Um, that's the upper part. So we have to, when someone is having an emotional response, let's say we pull them out of the game, or let's say they, they made a mistake in practice, their stress response is activated. It's, 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 and that is making it challenging for them to think clearly. So sometimes we try to come in with logical arguments to people in our lives, and, and let's just bring in, in this case, players. Hey, we, we pull them off the game or out of the game, or we try to coach them in the session, and what happens? They don't seem to listen. Well, they're having a bit of a stress response. They're not open. They're not receptive. Uh, they're just reacting to whatever happened, the mistake, the bad call, uh, the missed shot, whatever it be. So how do we get them to be receptive? Well, first off, you have to connect to the lower part of the brain, to the right part of the brain, uh, so that you can start uh, to then help them to correct. Um, some strategies to connect here that I want to sh uh, share with you. Uh, two really good books, like I mentioned, one is The Whole Brain Child. The other one is Never Split the Difference, which is a really cool book on negotiation that's written by an FBI negotiator. It's all rooted in brain science on how they approach that. It's got some really cool strategies that uh, we've implemented within sports, and we found them to be really, really effective, especially in those emotional moments of coaching. So uh, first thing is to remember the 73855 rule. Uh, Abrams, a researcher out of UCLA, uh, came up with this through his research, that essentially all our communication, all communication can be broken down in this way. 7% is about the words we use, the words we use. 38% is the tone with which we use them, and 55% is the body language that we use them with. So think about that, 7% is the words, 38% of what is communicated is our tone and 55% is our body language. So uh, it's really important that we make sure we're paying attention to our body language and our tone. Another thing that uh, we like to really encourage is to lead with an open question. Start lead with questions. Instead of offering solutions, just lead with a question on what are you seeing? What are you feeling? How are you, you know, what's going on out there? Um, you just, just trying to, or having them self-assess well, you know, what's your effort? But you really try to want to connect to their emotional side. So just, hey, what's going on? Um, and getting them to articulate their frustrations. When they articulate their frustration, that ties into what is called in psychology, name it to tame it. When we name what we're frustrated about, what we're angry about, what we're concerned about, what we're afraid of, that helps to tame that stress response. They call it, in psychology, they call it name it to tame it. Chris Voss calls it labeling. And we essentially, once they've articulated that, or we've listened to them, we have to be really actively listening, we'll say something like, it looks like, or it sounds like you're really upset because you've missed the last three shots of the game. Or it's, you know, it sounds like you're really frustrated because you got two questionable foul calls on you. Now, we're not saying that we're okay with their poor response on the court. Maybe they had a, 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 they erupted, maybe they got a technical, maybe they didn't hustle back on defense. We're just saying, I see you and I understand. I understand that you're frustrated. Not okay how you handled it, but we're just saying we well, understand and we see it. Uh, mirroring, mirroring your body language can be really important. Mirroring back what they're saying. I'm not going to go really into that because I want to talk about some strategies to correct. <clears throat> and one of those is to help them self-assess. So uh, Mark Bennett from PDS Coaching, he's a fantastic guy. He has the uh, UAE is what he talks about, unacceptable, acceptable, exceptional. Uh, we love using that. We Before Mark, I used to use bad, good, great, much prefer unacceptable and acceptable. Um, or you can just have them say, hey, what's your effort on a scale of one to five? By having them self-assess, they're more likely to take responsibility. Identity reflections, all right? Um, is this who you want to be? Is that the effort we said we wanted to give as a team? So just using those type of questions for them 
to really tie back into the bigger thing. Remember we talked about intrinsic motivation. Um, we want them to work hard, to have a good attitude, because that's the player they want to be, and that's the team they want to be. And when we use these questions, we bring it back to that instead of them of, of just kind of using shame or anger or the carrot in a sticks approach to getting them to do what we want them to, uh, to do. So this is the power of having players on your team identify their own standards. I've, I'll, I'll talk to you about what I call is uh, I have a culture transformation kit PDF. It, will walk you through how to run a team meeting in 30 minutes where you set your team standards. But if you've done that, you've empowered them to talk about the team they wanna be and who they wanna be and what that looks like, now you can come back to this in these moments. You wanna help them to self-correct. Okay, so what's one thing you can do to raise your effort level right now? What's one thing you can do to improve your attitude or whatever it be, or to support your team? So just having them identify what they need to do to fix uh, their behavior. You could ask, how could you have done that better? We're not going to dwell on the past. Let's let's just say quickly, what could you have done better? What could you do better next time that happens? Uh, whatever the circumstance being, let's say it's a bad call by the referee. Where what could have been a better response? You know, just using those questions to guide them. Now, uh, I'm going to jump into enforcing standards. There's various ways that we enforce the standards. Remember, you establish, you support, and then when necessary, we have to enforce the standards. There's progressive consequences, and we're, I'm going to do a deep dive into that in a second. There's restorative consequences, which um, are more about, hey, when someone's done something that's hurt the relationship, they've lost the trust of the coaches of the team, they need to not just pay the pay the fine, they need to do something to reconnect. So let's say two players get into a fight in practice. Uh, we may, in our programs, have them, instead of uh, doing a lot of running, we may say, hey, that's okay. The two of you, you guys are going to do 15 minutes of a partner workout at the end of every practice for the next month, right? I, there they have an opportunity to now restore the relationship by working together and spend some time together. Uh, there's a quick set, which is a lot of using re what we call resets, but it's a way we start every practice. Um, if you subscribe to the PDF that I'll, I'll tell you about a little bit later here, um, five ways to improve your culture. I talked a little bit about quick sets in there and how to, how to set those up. And resets, you know, you're running a drill, you're playing a game, you set some standards, they're not executing those, to, and they're not, they're not an acceptable, you just click reset on that time and you start the time over. Maybe you said, hey, we're gonna go two minutes here, we're gonna go three minutes. You just restart that time. Uh, you don't yell, you don't scream, you don't beg, you don't plead, you just reset, and you allow them to experience those consequences of having to start over. But let's just talk a little bit in, about the discipline strategies. This is the last bit, and then I'll uh, be, it'll be really respectful uh, of everybody's time here. But just some discipline strategies that are worth uh, discussing here. First off, let's talk about transactional discipline, which was my default response as a coach for pretty much the first eight years. Um, I'd use shame, I'd use anger, I'd use threats, I'd use sarcasm, and I'd use pleading uh, when players didn't do what they were supposed to do. And that's a very transactional way of, of approaching uh, a, a coaching, and it is effective uh, in the short term. It's all about rules and punishment. I set a rule, you didn't do it, now I have to punish you. The aim is compliance, right? Do what I want them to do. Uh, the effects are that it is extrinsic motivation. It only leads to sometimes short-term behavior change and it is rooted in fear. And here's what I learned. That is effective as long as they're afraid of you, but then you always must maintain that fear. Um, and uh, there will be players that come through that aren't afraid of you. That, and uh, when they're not, uh, or you can only have something to lord over them, then you're in, you're in you're in big trouble. We call it transformational discipline because discipline comes from the word, uh, you know, to, to teach. Um, and um, so when it comes to teaching, to building character, transforming the individual, this is a much more effective way. And I mentioned some of those things: questions, empathy, do-overs, like resets. Uh, and also loss of privilege, and I'll talk about that in a second here, but transformational discipline uses much more beneficial strategies 
It talks about boundaries and consequences, which is a largely semantics, but rules and punishment and versus boundaries and consequences. Rules I set and then I punish you. I'm doing it to you. Boundaries we set. We set the boundaries, we agree upon those boundaries, and then I enforce the consequences because you chose not to meet those standards. The aim isn't just compliance. It's about building character and it's about nurturing relationships. Relationships built, built on, I want what's best for you and I'm here to support you in that. And the effects are intrinsic motivation, uh, lasting change character, and a, a relationship that's built on love and respect. So uh, last bit here is our progressive consequences. So this is a little bit of the nitty gritty on how we enforce that. And let's talk about in a practice session, All right? Remember punishment is I do to you, consequence you did to yourself. So we talk about very important using the semantics. Remember the wording that we use is 7% of it, but this is an important 7%, but also pay attention to your tone and body language. You've lost the privilege you've lost the opportunity these are powerful powerful phrases okay remember when in a practice session um i'll come back here real quick in a practice a practice session these are things that we would use in a game session um and just and i'll explain how we would use those but essentially instead of putting kids on the line and running them instead of just sitting there and begging pleading bitching screaming and demanding they work harder or offering them treats or ice cream after the game or whatever the heck it is that we try to come up with as coaches. We just say, hey, sit out. You've lost the privilege. You've lost the opportunity to get better in that, in that drill. You've lost the opportunity to get better today. You've lost the privilege to play um, because we want them to see um, playing this sport, being a part of this team as a privilege and every practice as an opportunity. So in a practice consequence, this would look like progressively, you might, after you've established standards, after you've supported them, you've said, hey, uh, you've tried to step in, help them self-correct or self-assess and self-correct. Then at some stage, a couple of times down the, down the line, you're gonna say, all right, just, hey, you've lost the opportunity to get better in this drill. We'll see you in the next drill. Just take a st stand over there by the sideline. Now this seems a little bit more, uh, kind of crazy, like, right? The kid's not working hard, so I'm gonna sit him out of the drill, um, you know, but think about it. He's not working hard, so I'm gonna make him run, which and running's good for him. You know, there's just some, that just doesn't make sense either. So this is powerful because it's really teaching them to be appreciative and, and to, hey, you said you wanna be a good player. You said you wanna be a good team. So you gotta show up and put the work in, right? And that, and, and you have an opportunity and, if you don't meet those standards, you're going to lose that opportunity. So you might sit them out for an undefined amount of time as well. If, hey, you know what? Just sit over there. And when you're ready, you can come back in and you can hop in in this practice. Um, and you could sit out the rest of the practice if it reaches that stage. When, and the teams that I'm working with, we're not seeing this in a, as an everyday thing. Maybe it's sit out of drill, but we're seeing a handful of kids having to sit out practices. And so just because we're doing a really good job of establishing and supporting those standards. There's also the game consequence. I mentioned this earlier, you pull them out of the game, they sit out for undefined amount of time. Um, that's really based upon um, when they're back at an acceptable. Hey, when you're ready to be at acceptable, then you can go back in the game. We talked about that. So, and if it's really, really bad, you, they may even sit out the rest of the game. That's kind of it. Uh, you kind of got an overview of a lot of the different strategies and systems based upon some of those those, those um, kind of those uh, graphics earlier, um, just as supporting, establishing, establishing, supporting, enforcing. But overall, um, there's a lot of different strategies that are all uniquely connected to the, to those three phases. Um, and just if you're interested in learning more, you can check out my book. Uh, calling up it's on amazon uh it's on all those online retailers my podcast the coaching culture podcast we've got some phenomenal people a lot of new york times bestsellers on there we've had some you know incredible uh, sports psychologists on there uh, some high level coaches my website's thriveonchallenge.com uh, my twitter's at jp nurbin that's where i'm active um, and then my email is there and then i've got a lot of free pdfs that are worth checking out um, as well. 
I don't know if we're having a question period of this of this webinar, so I'm just kind of here. Just people yeah. shoot it, send them a question, right? Coach, we do have some questions coming in. Um, I'll fire them across to you, and then you can uh, share your thoughts on that. So, uh, firstly, really do appreciate you taking the time and sharing. Um, I can testify that the coaching culture, the, the podcast, and also the calling up book uh, is really good. And I think the calling up uh, book is a very easy, simple read, um, but it's got a lot of theories grounded in it. So, uh, coaches who are watching, I do recommend reading it. Uh, let's start you off with some questions. Uh, so the first one coming in, is there, in your opinion, no place at all of transactional discipline? Should we never raise our voice or never run players in practice? Or should we just do it in moderation? It's a great question. It's a really good question. And I look at it from a parenting perspective. How often do I want to yell and scream at my kids? Do you know what I mean? You know what I, mean? It's, I really would rather never do it. If they're obviously playing in the street, but if I car, I'm going to be running in there and jumping in and maybe yelling at that moment. But there's also times where I yell, scream, and do that. But I just feel like it, it takes more effort to have that transformational type discipline. Um, and maybe we don't always have time for that. You know, you've got to get results out of your team. But the more you use transactional discipline, the further you're going to get away from being an intrinsically motivated team. So it's always a trade-off. Okay, you want to get that win that day. You want to get them to work hard in that practice. And maybe it works. And people say, hey, you know, every once in a while, you got you to do that. Okay, that's fine. But you're stepping further away from really the, the culture that at least I want to create, which is a very player-led culture that's very intrinsically motivated. Um, once again, I'm not going to say it's never do it. I'm just going to say the more we do it, I think the further away from the team that we want to be. Gotcha. Appreciate that. Uh, and then how would you advise a coach for an under 12 team to go about setting non-negotiables? So non-negotiables are how you, you, you set them. Um, my non-negotiables, a lot of times I ask coaches what their non-negotiables are and they'll be like, uh, you know, have good attitude, work hard, and um, be a good teammate. I'm like, that's very broad. I cannot maintain that. I would say from a coach non-negotiables, what are the three things that drive you absolutely crazy or the that really impede your ability to develop the team that you want? So for me as a coach, being on time is the most important thing. Uh, now, obviously, there's always challenges to that. That's a really challenging one because of rides and lifts and buses and all that type of stuff. But so that's one that I have to really work hard at uh, to make sure that we're really clear on and that we're enforcing in a way that's still taking into account uh, people's situations. Be on time, listen, listen to the coach, listen to your teammates. Everyone needs to be listening. I can't stand it when I'm when I'm coaching or somebody else is speaking and somebody else is talking. It just throws me off my my game, you know. Uh, and the third one is to not complain. I just we complaining just really tears apart the culture. Those are the three that I'll fight for every day. I'll fight for those things every day. They're important to me. And I always say they're gonna help. I always tell players, they're gonna help you to have a good relationship with me. They're gonna help you create a great experience for your teammates because you want your teammates to have a great experience. They're gonna help you become a better player. You're gonna be much more effective. So that's how you would you set your non-negotiables. Three things that just you really need to see, but be specific, not have a good attitude and all that stuff. That's just not realistic. When it comes to team standards, there's the culture transformation kit PDF. Um, shoot me an email, I'll send it over to you. It will walk you through under 12s. I coached back in Pennsylvania three years ago, uh, a CYO, kind of an under 12s team. Worst uh, team I'd ever coached in like 13 years of coaching. It, it was unbelievable. They could not run, shoot, jump, whatever, but we had a heck of a time. And one of the things that we did after one of our early games was we got a bunch of pizza. We all sat down. I said, hey, what would make this a great year? They kind of talked about that. We had identified our purpose statement. And then we said, all right, how can we make that, how can we create that experience for each other? We talked about a bunch of things. We came up with five standards, five things that they said they needed to do in practices, in games, to create that experience. And then we talked about how we're going to hold each other accountable to that and support each other in that. So that's, that's essentially it. I did it for 30 minutes, and we had a good time doing it. 
Awesome, awesome. W with that, with what you just said, is that something then you would communicate with the parents or uh, and how would you do it? Just, okay, these are our team standards. Is it important for parents to know that or what are your thoughts there? Oh, 100%. I would take that and share it. I, put, I would put it into an email to every parent. <coughs> um, I run a much more nuanced uh, kind of workshop for a lot of teams that I work with that I go visit you know, all across the country in the States and, and we, I take them through that. And, um, but one of the big things is they share that with, um, they, they share that not only with uh, the parents, but in high schools, they're sharing that with the teachers, right? Because in, especially in the States, basketball is much more at the school system level. And then um, uh, we've even had the, at the collegiate level, the team send up those standards, especially in relation to their behavior in the classroom and the college level, uh, we send it out to their professors. So we don't just communicate it, <coughs> professors and administrators, teachers, all that. Gotcha, perfect. Uh, let me come back to the first question we asked you about uh, transactional discipline. The question that's coming in now is, uh, so you mentioned kids running, kids and running in the streets. Are, they moment, are there moments that line up with that metaphor of playing in the street so that we're so that what we're doing right now is the equivalent of our team about to get hit by a bus. Uh, I may need to raise my voice to stop that action ASAP. Is this is this far off? Do you want me to repeat yeah, that? that? No, I got that. I got that. That's a good question because I don't know if there is ever time <laughs> that it's actually they're about to get hit by a bus, which is kind of why I use the metaphor, which is like, is there a point that it's ever so desperate? You know? you know national championship game you know like it's the end of the road or this you know you know whatever it be okay maybe it's just like let's just get through this moment but especially early on in your year in your season you're gonna have you're gonna really set the tone for how you're coaching or the coach you're, you're gonna be that year and so if we lean on that more and there's probably gonna be more disruptive behaviors because you haven't really established your culture at that stage yet so you're gonna be fighting for it early on especially if you're trying to make a change. So that in, in those moments, it's so important that we're doing things right. You know, once you've got really strong relationships and high standards and there's a little bit of slippage, maybe you have that quick response with the player, you know, but I, yeah, I don't know if the metaphor really works, if there's a really an example where they're going to get hit by a bus. I just, if, if you don't mind, I just want to dig in a little bit there with what you said, um, high stakes game, national championship game, um, you know, playoffs, you, you you win, you go to the next round, you lose, you go home. Uh, I'm not sure if you you know the Tom Izzo example, which kind of blew up a couple of months ago, um, almost a year ago, actually. Um, but that's a situation where if he wins, he probably gets a bonus of 300000 or something. I'm not sure. And obviously, they keep their season alive. Looking back at that interaction he had with Aaron Henry, if they build the right culture early on in the season, is that okay at that moment in time or is that like he, he he's out of place i'm not going to speak to tom Izzo because you know there's there's a lot of coaches out there and i, and I never say this tom Izzo is not a bad coach he's not a bad person tom Izzo is an exceptional coach i think and I, i've talked to the world leading trauma psychologist um out there dr bruce perry he's been on my podcast and um and here, here's 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 the bottom line with it in that moment, there was a better way of doing things. There's a better way of doing things up until that point. He's doing a lot of other things really, really exceptional, which is why his team is exceptional. And he's an exceptional coach. And he's, uh, but why is he doing it that way? That's where, let's come to that real quick, right? Why? Because it's his default response, right? That's how he coaches. Is he being intentional? I, I don't think so. I know I wasn't, right? I wasn't being intentional. The game is on the line. I'm not thinking about money. And Tom Izzo wasn't thinking about money. Tom Izzo was thinking of the fact that he wanted a second national championship. He talks about that. He says he needs a second national championship to validate himself. So if I'm coaching from a place to validate myself, I'm transactional. I'm using players to validate myself. That's the problem with that. It's it, And yeah, there's a problem. There's a better way. We know the brain science and all that. But bottom line is that's transactional coaching. I'm using coaching to validate myself. And that's why I'm like, I lose my temper. That's why I lose my cool. And if it's transformational, it's not about me. It's not about, so 
that that's the issue in that. And I'm not trying to pick on Tim, Tom Izzo because we've all been in that situation. By God, I, I've been one of the worst at it. So, um, you know, it, it, we're all try. Every coach is trying to be the best coach they can be. I think some just don't know a better way or haven't just gotten there yet. Gotcha. I uh, appreciate you, you obviously responded to that. I'm a big fan of Tom Aza, so but it's just the one example that kind of pops to my mind as well. Um, yeah. So that concludes our questioning. Guys, I really do appreciate everybody tuning in. You've got Coach Aziz, uh contact information right there. I would encourage you guys to email him. Obviously, like he said, he will give you those PDFs and you'll find a lot of valuable stuff in them. Again, his book, Calling Up, and uh, subscribe to the Coaching Culture podcast a lot of great details about team cultures and building high character athletes. Uh, Coach, really appreciate your time. Thank you so much uh, for coming on. Thanks. Thanks for having me. I appreciate the opportunity.